ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Presentation Diagnosis of Alzheimer's Disease Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Those that wish to receive CME and CE credit, please complete the pretest pre located at the bottom of your screen. It is the red icon on the bottom left, second one in. Please read the instructions prior, prior to taking the pretest. This needs to be completed by 12.20 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Instructions will be given at that time. If you should require assistance during the call, please press star, then zero. This conference is being recorded. I would like to now turn the conference to your host, Amy Herr, with the Lewin Group. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, and welcome, everyone, to our call today. Um, my name is Amy Herr. I'm with the Lewin Group, and this is the Geriatric Competent Care Series on Caring for Individuals with Alzheimer's Disease. Today's webinar is titled Presentation and Diagnosis of Alzheimer's Disease. This webinar is the first in the series presented, by, presented in conjunction with the Community Catalyst and the Lewin Group and supported through the Medicare Medicaid Coordination Office at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Continuing medical education and continuing education credit is available for today's webinar from the American Geriatric Society and the National Association of Social Workers. In order to receive credit, um, please read the instructions, complete the pretest by 12.20 p.m. Eastern Time, participate in today's webinar, complete the post-test with a score of at least 80% by 2 p.m. Eastern, and complete the program evaluation form by 5 p.m. Eastern. CME and CE certificates will be emailed approximately four to eight weeks after the post-test is completed. <clears throat> MMCO is developing technical assistance and actionable item tools based on successful innovations and care models, such as this webinar series. To learn more about current efforts and resources, please visit our website, resourcesforintegratedcare.com, for more details. All of the Q&As and the slides from today's presentation and a recording will be posted on that website. Um, please contact rick at lewin.com, which is R-I-C at L-E-W-I-N.com if you have any questions or additional comments. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that all microphones will be muted throughout the presentation, but there will be a brief question and answer opportunity at the end of the presentation. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature on the WebEx to, to submit a question, or you all have an opportunity to ask via phone. At this time, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Carol Regan is a senior advisor with Community Catalyst with over 30 years of experience with national and state-based public policy and advocacy organizations. Carol's work has included policy research, analysis, and legislative advocacy primarily focused on health insurance coverage, programs and services for low-income children and families, long-term care, and workforce development. Before joining Community Catalyst, Carol was the Director of Government Affairs for PHI the Paraprofessional Health Care Institute, leading its federal policy work to improve the quality of care in the elder care and disability services sector by improving the quality of jobs. Before opening PHI's Washington, D.C. office, she was director of PHI's health care for Health Care Workers campaign, advocating affordable health coverage for direct care workers. She's held policy positions at the Children's Defense Fund, several leading labor unions, and in 2014 was the Interim Executive Director of the Herndon Alliance. Carol was an adjunct professor at the National Labor College and is a member of the National Academy of Social Insurance. Carol, Carol received her Master's in Public Health from the University of Michigan. Carol? Thanks so much, Amy, um, and welcome everyone to this webinar. We are very excited. Um, about the people we have, the faculty, and the opportunity to work with the Lewin Group and the Resources for Integrated Care and our partner with the American Geriatric Society to put together um, this webinar. Um, so I'm going to jump right into it by first uh, introducing you to our faculty all at once, and then we'll turn it over to them. Um, uh, and for those of you who want more information on Community Catalyst and our work around geriatric care um, for low-income consumers, uh, you can go to communitycatalyst.org for more information. So let me jump in and introduce all three of our uh, faculty. 
Um, Chris Callahan is a physician in the department, um, a professor in the Department of Medicine at Indiana University, and he was the founding director for the Indiana University Center for Aging Research, and he's a research scientist in the Regan Strife Institute. Uh, Dr. Callahan has more than two decades of experience in studying clinical interventions and new models of care designed to improve outcomes for older adults. His work began with a focus on late life depression and dementia and developed into research on multi-morbidity and fragmentation of care. His research is vast. It includes use of electronic medical records as well as Medicare and Medicaid claims data um, and clinical epidemiological studies um, <clears throat> at the Institute. Uh, for aging research, they focus on uh, particularly on vulnerable elders who are typically low income, minority, disabled, and dual eligible. Now, our next speaker will be Elizabeth Gallick, who is um, a PhD and a nurse practitioner specializing in the medical and neuropsychiatric care of older adults. She's an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Nursing, where she teaches in the Adult Gerontological Primary Care Nurse Practitioner Program, and she has a clinical practice in dementia symptom management in ambulatory, home care, and institutional settings. Dr. Gaelic conducts federally funded research to test the impact of interventions designed to optimize physical function, physical activity, mood, behavior of long-term care residents with moderate to severe cognitive impairment. Uh, she frequently presents at national conferences and has authored many peer-reviewed articles and books, chapters on dementia. So we're excited to have her with us as well. And our last speaker will be Irene Moore, who is a social worker and professor of family and community medicine at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine. And she's also the director of the Geriatric Evaluation Center at Maple Knoll Village in Cincinnati. Irene was recruited to the University of Cincinnati in 1987, following five years at the Duke University Center for the Study of Aging to develop the Geriatric Evaluation Center at the University of Cincinnati. Um, Ms. Moore has served in numerous leadership positions in geriatric social work, including serving on the American Geriatric Society committees focused on public education, ethno-geriatrics, and interdisciplinary team care. She was a member of AGS's Health and Aging Foundation Board of Directors and served as vice chair for many years. Lastly, in 1998, she was awarded the first non-physician AGS fellow status. She serves on the board of many of Cincinnati area senior services and on the Alzheimer's Association Professional Advisory Committee. So you can see we have a really wonderful uh, group of people to, to take us into this webinar. Each of them are going to speak for um, you know 15 or so minutes, and then we're going to have some time for questions at the end. So we know that many of you will have many questions. So let me uh, turn it over. Right now, the next thing we're going to do is uh, learn a little bit more about you all. Um, we've heard about our presenters. We'd like to learn a little more about you. So the next thing we'll do is ask you to take this poll. Which of the best following best describes your professional area? So if you could take a minute, choose which one, hit submit, and we'll be able to learn a little bit about who's on the call. So I'll give you another five seconds. Submit your answer, and then we'll be able to see the poll results. Okay, let's look at the results. Terrific. Look, we have half people in social work, um, about almost tw a quarter in medicine, nursing, or physicians, many in health administration, and some advocacy as well as other. Thanks so much. Uh, let's go to the next poll. So in your work, what is your primary role? I hope we've captured it. So once you decide, submit the answer. Take a few more seconds. Great. Well, well, we have about 20% are administrators, 25% are clinicians, many educators, consumer advocates, and a number of others. So we'll have to do a little better job figuring out who you others are. So if you want to take a minute and let us know after this webinar um, at RIC at uh, Lewin.com, we could buy out more. Thank you very much. So the next last poll question. 
in what setting do you primarily work? So again, take a few minutes, take a few seconds, hit the submit answer. A few more seconds to get you to answer. Thank you. And then we'll look at those poll results. Oh, great. Look, we have a number of people from managed care plans organizations, some ambulatory care, some long-term care, and then clearly um, facilities as well as home care. So great. We have a great distribution of people and their experience. Thank you so much. So now um, we know a little bit about us and you. Let's turn it over to Dr. Callahan to start, um, to start our webinar. Thanks very much. Chris? Uh, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I think uh, what might be helpful to frame our discussion is for us to talk about a case study, and I imagine this presentation will be fairly familiar to all of you. So imagine that you're seeing a 70-year-old man. Uh, he's brought in by his daughter, and... Um, Maybe you have three or four people in the waiting room and you've been caring for this man for a number of years for hypertension and heart disease and he tells you he has no complaints and that he's feeling well and he has no difficulty with his medications. You have your hand on the doorknob and his daughter uh, says that, wait just a minute because she's concerned that her dad is forgetting to take his medications and he recently damaged his car when he was attempting to pull in the garage. And as you learn more from the daughter, you hear that it's been a gradual progressive decline in his short-term memory. Um, his functioning has also been declined, uh, declining over the past year, and she says she now has to help him with his taxes and help him pay his bills, and she's, he's forgetting his appointments. And you do a physical exam and a mental status exam, which are normal, uh, but you notice that he has decreased insight into his cognitive complaints and maybe some poor judgment. And you complete a mini mental state examination and you find a score of 22. So the question that we hope we're going to help you address today is what do you think is wrong with the patient? and what are the next steps, if any, that you need to take with regard to further testing, and then what guidance are you going to give the patient and his family. So let's look at a few definitions first. Dementia is a decline in memory, language, problem solving, or other cognitive deficits that affect a person's ability to perform their everyday activities. A few things that we should point out in that first bullet is that dementia is more than memory loss. Uh, we're looking for memory loss and impairment in some of these other areas before we make a diagnosis of dementia. And sometimes you'll hear us summarize that dementia is a decline in cognitive function from a prior level of functioning. And it has to be severe enough to impair social functioning. And there's a few key points there. If someone scores poorly on the mini mental status exam, but they've had lifelong cognitive impairment, that is not a decline in their cognitive functioning or may not be. And when we talk about social functioning and everyday activities, that doesn't mean activities of daily living like so many of you are, are uh, familiar with uh, like toileting and other basic activities of daily living. It's um, social functioning, things like paying your bills and um, managing your home and the types of things that we need to do to live independently. So dementia is caused by cell death in the brain. That's how we think about it now, that neurons are actually dying and they stop functioning. And the parts of the brain that are impaired first are those that deal with um, short-term memory. And um, we uh, believe that Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia. But on the next slide, we're going to talk a little bit about that. If you trained many years ago, like uh, over 10 or 15 years ago, 
This slide shows you some new concepts about dementia. We now understand that, develop, that dementia develops insidiously, and it's over decades, not just over years, and that the pathology, the cell death, that's eventually going to lead to a clinical presentation, that's been going on a long time before the symptoms show up. So if you take a look at this diagram over on the right side of the slide, um, uh, try to uh, find the brown line. It's the one you can find easiest by looking at the right side of the slide, and it's kind of at the bottom. That brown colored line, that is the time course for the functional impairment when someone presents to you because they're really having difficulty with um, living independently. If you look right above that, you see the green, li green line, and that shows you that the cognitive deficits probably started before the functional deficits. And then all these other pretty colored lines are, are various biomarkers that are under study right now. And it's very clear, particularly if you look over at the left-hand side of the slide, that these biomarkers, which we believe are indicators of neurons dying, um, that's been going on for decades ahead of the symptoms. So a lot of the research and a lot of the interest in medications and in prevention, which you'll hear about later um, in our talk, is moving up to that pre-symptomatic and mild cognitive impairment stage with the hope that if we intervened early, we might be able to prevent some of the functional decline. The last thing we want to say on this slide, the third bullet, is that while we still believe Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia, increasingly we see that people often have mixed pathology. Um, and that mixed pathology is primarily Alzheimer's disease pathology and vascular dementia. The next slide, we're taking a look at the main subtypes of dementia. Um, sometimes your patients will be confused about the difference between Alzheimer's disease and the word dementia since they're kind of thrown around as um, synonyms. But of course, Alzheimer's disease is just one of the causes of dementia. I mentioned earlier that we have vascular dementia, but there's also Lewy body dementia and frontotemporal dementia. And we think of Alzheimer's disease as presenting initially with the short-term memory loss. This is going to be the prototypical uh, patient. We have other patients, though, that they or their family might say the biggest issue is language impairment, maybe difficulty finding a word, or instead of naming an object, you talk about the function of an object. It's not a watch. It's that thing that you keep time with, for example. Other people have trouble with executive um, functions, such as being able to plan or to imagine how they would plan to be at their appointment. And these are the folks that are going to have vascular risk factors like hypertension and hyperlipidemia. Then we have Lewy body dementia that one of the key hallmarks is uh, hallucinations. That these folks may also have visual spatial impairment and they um, may present with features of Parkinson's disease. But the key is that the cognitive impairments usually happen before the motor impairments. And a very difficult uh, um, form of dementia is frontotemporal dementia. And these are the patients that are presenting with a change in the personality. And sometimes it's going to be a change that is embarrassing to the family or um, the uh, patient is inappropriate in social interactions. Remember, though, if someone presents to you late in the um, course of the illness, you are going to have a difficult time distinguishing the subtypes because they begin to merge together. So what about mild cognitive impairment? Because we said we wanted to find this earlier. Um, and this is still a, a clinical diagnosis. This is the patient that comes to you with subjective memory complaints, but there is no impairment in function uh, or um, uh, difficulty with their social functioning. I've put a very long um, couple of uh, sentence there that comes from the references you see, but the key in this um, sentence is that this is inherently a clinical judgment. 
is it MCI or is it dementia? And when I say clinical judgment, I don't mean that the clinician alone is trying to decide. This is an area where you really need the input of an informant. Um, that informant that's with the patient every day that might be able to see these more subtle uh, declines in a um, person that you could then subjectively say was a significant interference in their ability to function and work or in their usual activities. <clears throat> risk factors uh, then, age is far and away the biggest risk factor. The good news is you have to have a long life uh, uh, to be at risk for dementia for most people. Of course, there are uh, unfortunate patients that develop Alzheimer's disease in their 40s and 50s, but far and away the biggest risk factor is growing old. Of all of the people with dementia, about a third of them are over the age of 80. Other risk factors are low educational attainment, family history, and then cardiovascular um, morbidity. Another thing is that um, over half of the people with um, Alzheimer's disease are women. Uh, this is partially because women um, live longer, but um, as I show talk about these risk factors then, you can begin to reflect back on the case that we presented um, and think about the um, risk factors and the symptoms that that person was uh, presenting with. Just a little bit on clinical epidemiology. There's already about 5 million people with dementia. There's going to be a whole lot more in 2050. And that whole lot more is going to be a bunch of us. Um, worldwide, it's one of the leading causes of disability. It's a major contributor to health care cost. And most of the people diagnosed with dementia are going to die within five years. But remember, most of them were over the, 80, over the age of 80 to begin with. And so we have a lot of people dying with dementia as opposed to dying from dementia. So what's going on in primary care? Um, we hear a lot about what primary care isn't able to do with regard to chronic conditions. And we believe a lot of these problems have to do with the way primary care is designed. So most people with dementia have other chronic conditions that the primary care team is um, trying to deal with. Primary care is not well designed, it's not well funded to identify or care for people with dementia, and those new care models um, are relatively new to begin with. What's difficult is that to give best practice care for dementia, it often requires you to redesign the practice setting. Some people say re-engineer, uh, but it is a very purposeful attempt to align your practice with the idea that you want to do case finding and care management for people with dementia. So let's look at some of the uh, typical barriers. Let's just say you're a primary care team and you have about 2,000 patients. Well, right off the bat, only about 300 of them are going to be over the age of 65. Um, of those 300, Half will have another three or more chronic conditions, lots of things to deal with. So the doc already needs 10 hours a day, maybe another seven hours a day to provide preventive services. That doesn't happen, and that's why we move to team-based care. Uh, we have, um, therefore, about, say, two dozen people in my panel that have dementia. And... Um, that's kind of hard to make the case to redesign my practice for those two dozen um, people. And then there are other barriers, like the patients themselves may not want to be labeled with a diagnosis of dementia. So I'm going to finish up with the last couple of slides, and then Dr. Gallick is going to talk to you a little bit more practically about um, making a diagnosis and doing an evaluation. But some basic principles here, some mile-high principles. Uh, this is a journey. Uh, it's a journey for the patient. It's especially also a journey for the caregiver. It's going to unfold over five to ten years, and the needs of that dyad are going to change over time. It is very difficult, if not impossible, to deliver best 
practices care if you don't have a family caregiver or a professional caregiver to work with. Most of what we're going to do is going to be funneled through that caregiver. Care for persons with AD is centered around the caregiver and the care recipient. So you're, there's a dyad presenting to your clinic, just like in our case. We have to organize care around teams for the reasons we already said. And um, care begins with an accurate uh, diagnosis. What did we mean by practice redesign? Well, um, we don't yet uh, screen older adults who don't have symptoms. It turns out that we don't have evidence that that's safer for patients. But we do do case finding. And case findings, just like we talked about with the case uh, that uh, we opened up with, you didn't screen that person at, at, without symptoms. Symptoms were brought to you, uh, in this case by the daughter. So um, one way to redesign your practice um, is to say, if I do have a case finding, and we may in this particular case, what am I going to do? What's my practice going to do in terms of diagnosis, um, care, and um, referral? Here's just one example. Maybe use the Medicare wellness visit as an opportunity for um, case finding. You want to choose a case finding instrument that your practice is comfortable with and familiar with and you and the rest of your team use it consistently and give it in the same way. Uh, Dr. Gallick's going to talk about uh, some examples of that. And then develop a protocol. Uh, case finding with an instrument like an MMSE is not a diagnosis. It's a way to find people that need an evaluation. You need to know what's available in your community. Maybe your practice is next door to an Alzheimer's disease center. Maybe it isn't. Um, and then remember that an important source of um, ongoing care that remains the responsibility of the primary care doc are the patient's other chronic conditions. And sometimes these chronic conditions may be more the proximate cause of a person's disability than the um, dementia. So there's a slide here that has the references uh, for m much of the material that um, I just covered. Um, the, um, we're going to uh, see more resources later on in the presentation. And I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Gallick now. Thanks, Dr. Callahan. And good afternoon, everyone. We're going to spend some time now talking about the assessment and diagnosis of dementia and how it can be helpful in your practice. So on our next slide, um, for individuals with a complaint um, uh, of cognitive decline, it is important to identify treatable conditions that could cause or perhaps contribute to the underlying symptoms that they're experiencing. So in our first case with the gentleman coming in with his daughter, um, and we found some evidence of some cognitive decline and some functional impairment, it would be important to help rule out some of these treatable conditions, things like depression, substance abuse, um, maybe he had a few drinks before he got in the car to, to pull out the door or before he even came into your office. Does he have any vitamin or mineral deficiencies? Or is there um, a problem with his central nervous system, perhaps a tumor? The other thing we need to think about um, are, is delirium. So um, because delirium can mimic dementia, it can be things like medication side effects, particularly medications that act upon the central nervous system, or other medical conditions that may be acute, such as a dehydration, an infection, uh, low oxygen levels, such as in hypoxia, or perhaps an acute exacerbation of a chronic illness. In our next slide, um, we're comparing depression, dementia, and delirium. And the most important take-home point really out of this slide is that these syndromes often coexist so, because individuals with dementia are more prone to depression and they're also more prone to developing uh, delirium or acute changes in their mental state. So for delirium, um, the, the things that really help differentiate it is the sudden onset 
um, the fluctuating course in terms of symptoms, and that someone's attention is really disrupted where you'll see it's intact with both dementia and depression. There's more of an abrupt decline in function, and you may see um, fluctuations in terms of sleep-wake cycles. In our next slide, we're just briefly reviewing components of the diagnostic assessment uh, for a cognitive complaint. We want to make sure that we have a good history uh, of, the, of the patient's challenges and problems, that we do a thorough physical exam, a functional assessment, a mental status exam that includes some cognitive assessment, and then last, consider some additional diagnostic tests if they are warranted. So first, we're going to focus on the patient history. And here, you want to get an idea of the onset and the progression of the symptoms. Were the changes that have been seen, has that just been something over the past few weeks? And perhaps a new medication was started two or three months ago that may be contributing to it, and perhaps it could be a delirium? Or is this something that's been started you know, maybe a year or two ago, there's been some gradual progression of the symptoms? So you want to get an idea about that. You also want to have a description of the nature of the symptoms with focus primarily in three areas, what cognitive changes are noticed, functional as well as behavioral. So cognitive would be things like memory complaints, um, if they're having trouble perhaps finding words or if their judgment is off. Functional may be um, like in our case, the gentleman was having trouble doing his taxes and paying his bills in addition to driving. And then behavioral may get at some of the neuropsychiatric symptoms that we sometimes see in conjunction with Alzheimer's disease, such as delusions, hallucinations, depressive symptoms, uh, sleep disturbance, wandering, etc. It's also helpful to find out if there's a family history of dementia. And you want to ask about the age of onset, what type of symptoms the person had, and progression. It's helpful to interview the patient to get an idea of their perception of the symptoms. In many instances, their perceptions won't necessarily match what the informant tells you, but it will give you some insight um, into their, um, their own insight and their judgment regarding their deficits and what is important to them. And lastly, and I, I can't stress this enough, just as Dr. Callahan had, it's very important to have a reliable informant and to engage that person as part of the interview. And if at all possible, and we'll talk about some ways to do this in a few seconds, um, to have this reliable informant interview be private. Uh, because in many instances, family members or, or professional caregivers who are with the patient may not feel comfortable um, giving you all of the detail that you really need in terms of the history in front of the patient. So in our next slide, we're talking a little bit more about patient history. We want to make sure that we review the medical history as well as the patient's medications. Have there been any recent changes in either of those areas? We want to pay particular attention to medications um, such as anticholinergic medications. Oftentimes, these are things that um, people may take for urinary incontinence are often anticholinergic, narcotic medications that people may be taking for pain, or psychotropic medications, basically any medicine that acts upon the central nervous system, because this may be a clue to an underlying delirium. We also want to find out if the person has had any recent falls or trauma, if there's any substance use history, either um, current or in the past. And then it's also important to have an idea of the individual's personal history and what type of social support they have. Uh, what, their, what is their educational level like? Um, what did they do as an occupation or hobbies or interests? And what is their current living situation? And is anyone there to support or help them? In our next slide, uh, we're going to briefly discuss some strategies for success when gathering a history. So in a busy um, practice, whether you're in primary care or other settings, it's helpful to have a few uh, moments to review medical records in advance when it's possible. 
um, because some workup may have been done at another place, and you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel there. So it's helpful to be able to look at those ahead of time so that you're not flipping through documents or flipping through the computer while you're with the patient and family or caregiver. It also may be helpful to obtain some preliminary history from the caregiver prior to the appointment. With um, the emergence of uh, EMR systems now, um, some practices are using um, history gathering tools that the informant can fill out or that the patient can fill out online before they come in, or it may even happen on paper. Uh, sometimes family members or other caregivers may call the practice um, or the provider ahead of time to mention some concerns. And then lastly, and perhaps what I find to be most useful, is really having a team approach to care. And so that at the time of the visit, um, you're having mutual activities. So both the patient and the caregiver are involved in the assessment process simultaneously. So the patient may be um, with um, the nurse doing some cognitive assessment and you know, another team member, perhaps the social worker, um, may be getting some information from the family member. In our next slide, um, this gets on to kind of case finding, really where, where someone is not necessarily coming in with a chief, comp a chief cognitive complaint. However, you may notice um, during the course of the visit that some red flags go up. And these could be things about the patient is consistently late for appointments or gets confused about the location, uh, that the, pa uh, the patient may not remember recent events or conversations, or when, an indivi when a patient comes in with a uh, caregiver and that individual is constantly referring questions to the caregiver for them to answer. Or perhaps you just may notice that their dressing is not what it used to be or they may have some poor hygiene. And these could be um, some red flags to trigger further assessment. In our next slide, we're talking about the second component, which is uh, the physical examination. So you want to do a careful physical examination to identify acute medical problems with particular attention to a neurologic assessment and a musculoskeletal exam, particularly looking at um, gait and balance. Perhaps the individual may have had a stroke and you may be able to pick this up um, on a neurologic and musculoskeletal exam. And that can give you some clues to a diagnosis that may be more vascularly related um, rather than um, Alzheimer's disease or something else. You want to assess their, their strengths and their reflexes, noticing for any um, weakness or asymmetry. In our next slide, we're going to talk a bit about functional assessment. And some of this is part of the history taking, um, as we mentioned earlier. So you're trying to get some of this from a reliable informant in terms of what the patient is able to do um, for him or herself. And it's, again, as Dr. Callahan mentioned, uh, many patients may present and they may be independent or may only need a little cueing with their activities of daily living, but where you may see more deficits is in their instrumental activities of daily living. So things like driving or coordinating transportation or managing finances, um, dealing with a telephone, um, cooking for themselves. And some scales um, that you, there are many, many rating scales designed to do this. Some examples um, the, for activities of daily living would be the Barthel Index. And the Lawton Index it would be a scale that you could use to measure instrumental activities of daily living. And um, additionally, if you have time, having some actual performance time for the, for the patient you can even, it becomes a test of motor apraxia or their loan, learned motor skills, getting them, um, you could say to them, show me how you would brush your hair or how you would brush your teeth or um, different things like that. And fourth is our mental status exam. And we, in the mental status exam, you need to realize that several factors can influence performance, educational level, their hearing, their primary language, or their baseline intellectual function. So components of the mental status exam in our next slide inc includes level of consciousness, appearance and behavior, speech and language, 
mood, thought content and process, insight and judgment, and cognition. And we'll talk about each of these in the next slide in a little greater detail. So you want to notice, if, is the patient alert, awake, are they lethargic, um, or are they hypervigilant or um, very, very alert? In terms of um, their level of alertness, if they're lethargic, it could indicate a delirium. Their appearance and behavior, you want to look at their appearance and grooming, as we mentioned before. Speech and language, are they having any trouble finding words? Or is there a change in their um, spontaneity of their speech? With their mood, are they making statements that are negative about themselves? Is their outlook on the future poor? This could indicate a depression. You also want to look at evidence of fixed false beliefs, which are delusions or hallucinations, which are sensory impairments without a stimulus or any bizarre thoughts. And then the, the last piece that you want to focus on would be uh, assessment of cognition. And in our next slide, we're going to go over the cognitive exam. So with the cognitive exam, there's a variety of areas that we want to cover. Memory um, with immediate recall, delayed recall, or remote memory. So remote memory, you could ask them things that happened long ago. Um, for orientation, that's um, do they know where they are? What is the season? What is the month? Verbal fluency gets to some of that the problems with language. Um, and one thing that you can do with them is get them to uh, name as many animals as they can think of in a minute, in a minute or grocery items. Um, you can give a patient a phonemic cue asking them to name S words, and that's a little more challenging um, for them to do, so they may not get as many. Uh, what you would expect is that people are probably able in, in a minute to get around 20 animals, 20 grocery items, and perhaps 15 S words, and often that's considered normal verbal fluency. Visual spatial abilities can be assessed through intersecting pentagons, drawing a cube, or clock drawing, and clock drawing, drawing is part of the mini cog, which we'll get to in a minute. And insight and judgment, we've mentioned that before in terms of their awareness of their deficits. You could also give them situations in terms of problem solving. Um, you know, something like if there was a plumbing leak in your home, what would you do? And see what they say. Or if there was a fire, what would you do? And then lastly, executive functioning and ways to assess this quickly could be serial sevens, threes, or verbal trails where you have people combine numbers and letters um, sequentially. There's a rapid cognitive screening called the MINICOG, which is on our next slide, and it includes three item recall coupled with clock drawing test. And there's some examples of some of the clocks indicating mild, moderate, and severe impairment. And um, missing kind of anything with clock drawing or even one item on the delayed recall is considered a positive screen. The next slide um, just shows some additional cognitive assessment tools. Um, three of them are free for use. The mini mental status exam has been widely used in the past but is now proprietary. And then the last component of our assessment process is considering diagnostic testing. So there may be some laboratory studies that you would order to rule out metabolic problems, um, electrolyte disturbances, anemia, hypothyroidism, and certain vitamin and mineral deficiencies. And you may also consider ordering brain imaging studies um, that are structural imaging studies, such as a CT scan or an MRI scan. And most of these tests are really used to clarify or rule out other conditions that cause similar symptoms to Alzheimer's disease. And lastly, I'm going to very briefly touch on the future of biomarkers for um, Alzheimer's disease. And this is an exciting um, area of research. A biomarker is something that can be used to measure um, 
accurately and reliable and indicates the presence of, presence of a disease. And an example of that would be to diagnose diabetes, we order a fasting blood sugar. And if you get a certain level, um, that's, you then have diabetes. We don't quite have that yet for Alzheimer's disease, but there are several things um, that are um, in, engaged in clinical trials. Um, right now. So we're looking at beta amyloid that can be measured in cerebrospinal fluid um, or in urine. Um, and additionally, um, biomarkers that can um, be used with PET scans. These are um, radio tracers. And then you would do a, um, a PET scan and it may show signs of um, beta amyloid in the brain. Now, beta amyloid is a characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, but its presence cannot be used to actually give somebody a clinical diagnosis because many individuals may actually have, as Dr. Callahan was saying, signs of beta amyloid in their brain before they go ahead and develop clinical symptoms. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to our colleague, um, Irene Moore, who's going to discuss with you uh, communicating um, of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and caregiving concerns. Irene? Thank you. What a great team and a wonderful lead-in to communicating with the caregiver and the actual individual with Alzheimer's disease. I have, t I have four pearls that I want to share with you, and I'd like to begin with the first two. One is start where the patient or the caregiver is. And embedded in that is using open-ended statements. Examples of what I think of in open-ended is I would like for you to share with me as much as possible. Or something like, please describe or when you say your daddy's confused, please give an example of the behaviors your father actually exhibits. With all the medical appointments and television news and written information, the family, you are really the expert on your individual relative. Um, I wonder if you had to give a diagnosis what you think it might mean, and despite meeting with Dr. Callahan and Nurse Gallick, um, I'm always surprised when people say, thank goodness, after the evaluation, I learned that mother really doesn't have Alzheimer's, it's just ordinary dementia. Alzheimer's disease is a really hard word for some people to come to terms with. Um, so think of having a conversation to avoid excess questioning. In communicating the diagnosis, keep the focus on both the Alzheimer's individual and the caregiver. Naturally, professionals often focus comments and decision making towards the caregiver and stop talking to the identified patient. Some professionals like to sit in order of themselves first, then the patient, and then the caregiver, always keeping the patient in the middle. It's important to explain the importance of understanding the diagnosis to help develop a realistic plan. An another pearl is transparency. Give honest facts. And in transparency is preparation. Prepare the caregiver for exposure, the, the consequences of multiple caregivers. I recommend get a notebook and write down whom you talk to, the date, and their phone number. Conflicting views, points of views may emerge, but this is how we as professionals may work to build trust. Then later the caregiver said, will say, oh, that Dr. Callahan or Dr. Beth Gallick, she told me that this was going to happen. So prepare the caregiver for a fragmentation of care. 
in further communication, allow the caregiver control to make decisions and meet the patient's needs, giving empathetic help to identify and respect their choices. In supporting the caregiver's coping skills, help to maximize their productivity and preserve their strengths. A wild goose chase or unprofessional handoff is highly frustrating to the caregiver and is a poor use of their limited energy and patience and the time they've taken off from work. And it displaces irritation into other levels of the caregiver's life, their role as a parent, their role as being an employee. Support the caregiver's advocacy for the patient in thinking what works. Examine the creation of unfair service barriers. Remember, care professionals will come and go, but the family caregiver is the one consistent team member. Remember, the caregiver is a crucial, consistent source of history across the time and caregiving settings. In talking to the individual with Alzheimer's disease, as we've mentioned, the importance of that individual's self-perceived abilities. One example noted regards driving. Um, I commonly hear from an Alzheimer's individual, I will stop driving when I believe I'm no longer safe on the road. However, in meeting with the family, there are unexplained dents on the car. At this point, getting the caregiver's perception also, would you allow, as the adult son, your younger children to ride alone with your father? Um, it's important to let the family give the answer. And this is common that the family will then say, um, well, no, I wouldn't ride with him. And that opens the door to driving safely. And it's in really critical here to get the buy-in from the family first before making recommendations. There's nothing worse than recommending to someone to stop driving and other family members are saying uh, opposite. Um, they need to drive. Their driving's not so bad. He can see better than me and that sort of thing. So think about what would be real help. What social workers may recommend just may not fit with the patient's perception of needed services. But think liberation with smart, in-home, creative technology, dignified digital sensors, all the way to basic grab bars and old-fashioned gadgets like baby monitors help to promote in-home safety. As clinicians, we have lots of forms and paperwork that we want to complete. But please remember, starting where the patient is, does the patient know the reason for the assessment? Despite time restraints, always prepare the patient for the next step. And use reassurance, like we're all in this together, you've been for an assessment, you've seen Dr. Callahan, if something comes up that will be helpful, you'll hear about it. Your family is standing by. Remember to listen to the patient when discussing the diagnosis. And the demographics, from my personal and professional experience, the most cost-effective Alzheimer's disease intervention is the empowered caregiver. And caregivers come in all different shapes and sizes. And there are many different ways to be a caregiver. For instance, looking at sons, they often focus on the legal and business aspects of caregiving. Um, it takes a lot of diligence 
to do that paperwork for a disabled or an older adult. Um, not everyone has to do non-personal or not everyone has to do personal care. This non-personal care is really critical in remembering the informal network of family, neighbors, and the faith community. All are caregivers. The fact that this diverse audience is taking so much time for this topic will make a compelling difference in the lives of caregivers and their family members. To reemphasize the pearls which were embedded in my comments, start where the patient and the caregiver are. Secondly, remember not one size fits all. Use open-ended statements. Third, get the buy-in for each patient. There's some help that can be given despite the inevitable. And the communication very clearly with the caregiver um, <coughs> may be contacted to set up services by many, many different callers. So care managers are often the point person and are proactive in setting up services. Ensure that the services are dignified. Above all, we want to avoid putting already stressed people through hoops. Why bother to refer to services that the patient or the caregiver don't really want? We want to help caregivers honor old promises, like I'd never move you to a nursing home. We first need to know what the patient and the caregiver's wishes were, so we may avoid trying to convince them to embrace the plan that only we as the professional believe is best. So objectively, please look at the caregiver and the patient's actual situation. Will the services be acceptable? In thinking of the special considerations when working with families and caregivers, we like to consider ethnic diversity, health literacy, and the previous relationship with the caregiver and patient. So first with ethnic diversity, as we see on the next slide, ethnic diversity may inhibit the caregiver's comfort in asking for clarification. A side effect of this will be the caregiver agreeing when honestly they do not understand or agree with the clinician. Remember the transitions of care to include fundamental cultural expectations. Particularly in the Hispanic and Asian culture, the spokesperson or decision maker for the family may not be the primary caregiver. Next in Considering health literacy, many patients or caregivers may not ask questions in order to keep their lack of understanding private. With limited health literacy, please remember the more confusing the choices are, the more confusing it may be for the caregiver. The patient and caregiver will need all the help they can get in navigating the system. It's important to avoid jargon while every professional discipline has its own language. Remember to use plain English. Some older Hispanics, for example, don't read in Spanish and many dual eligibles aren't online, but their children may be. Written educational materials must be at the fourth grade reading level. 
and consider the previous relationship between the caregiver and the Alzheimer's individual. A common statement that you may hear is, my older sister was mother's favorite, but now I'm the responsible person. Or previous patterns and strategies for coping with the trauma are direct predictors for how this family will deal with an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. Understand bias, understand Alzheimer's, understand, most importantly, the caregiver and the patient's experience. Ask about past family history of coping with Alzheimer's disease or late life memory problems. In assisting with caregiver response to the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, recognize fear. In terms of understanding the family, the fear of uncertainty, how long is this going to last, how bad is it going to be, for many families is the biggest burden to bear. Acknowledge that this is new information for the family and they must kindly hear it more than once and in different ways. Understanding Alzheimer's disease may ex can assist with coping and response, especially the slow course. And caregivers need clear guidance to assist with their specific situation. Assisting the caregiver provide timely services and accurate resource information. Anticipate the caregiver's need to relinquish. However, for many caregivers, the thought of relinquishing even the most highly burdensome task is extremely difficult. Uh, I, as a caregiver, always felt nobody could powder my mother's feet as good as I could. Assist the caregiver as a cornerstone to maintaining a successful plan of care and, main, and help them maintain control of their lifestyle and personal environment. In thinking about resources, there are many, and here are two of my favorite. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, I don't know that there's much they don't do. They are a tremendous resource um, at all levels of this journey with Alzheimer's disease. And they're always expanding to develop new initiatives for care of the Alzheimer's individual and their family members. The Elder Locator um, is a wonderful resource that is tried and true. It's been around for many years in helping uh, caregivers locate services for their geographically removed family members. And the Alzheimer's Disease Education and Referral Source Center, again, excellent and the National Institute of Neurologic Disorders. Uh, as noted on the resources for integrated care website is a whole listing of dementia resources posted there. Uh, you've been a great audience and now moderator Carol Reagan is going to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you, all of you. I'm um, not going to take a lot of time before I turn it over to questions, but I want to appreciate what great um, presentations we had and um, the time we have left for questions, and I'm sure there's many. Uh, I just want to make two, uh, three quick comments. One is I think uh, I'm struck with um, how this focus on dementia really does highlight the need for person and family-centered care. Um, we talk a lot about that, but it's really evident with uh, folks with this diagnosis that um, 
it really is about the patient or the consumer and their family, and this uh, presentation reflects the importance of that, and I would argue for other uh, uh, care issues as well for people with other chronic conditions. And then the second thing is, is which I think our panel, our presenters reflected, is the need for coordination and a team. Um, this is clearly, we you know, have a physician and a nurse and a social worker, and you can imagine um, that team is is what's really needed with with people um, with dementia um, as well as other people, which is now underway in some of the dual um, financial alignment demonstrations. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to mention one more thing as I turn it over, and I realize we introduced myself, but not Community Catalyst. And just for those of you on the line who don't know Community Catalyst, we're a national consumer advocacy organization that works to bring the consumer's voices into the decisions about health and health care. And one of our projects, which is how we got involved in this, these kind of educational webinars, is we have a project working to support the integrated coordinated care for those who are duly enrolled in Medicare and Medicaid. And if you go to our website, you can sign up for our, um, our, our uh, newsletter on that. So with that, let me turn it back over to Amy, who's going to lead us through some uh, question and answers, and we have another 20 minutes for that. So thanks so much for joining this conference, and turn it over to, to Amy. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. Um, in the remaining time we have left, we want to answer some questions and answers questions from the audience, um, but just so everyone knows, um, if you're seeking CME or CE credit, you can begin to complete the post-test now. Um, you'll click on the red widget. There's a picture of it on your screen right now, but the, you'll click on the widget at the bottom of your screen to complete the post-test. Um, as a reminder, you need to score 80% or higher on the post-test, and we allow for two attempts. Um, you'll have until 2 p.m. Eastern time to complete the post-test. Um, also, if, you, if you're on the call for credit, you'll also need to complete the webinar evaluation, and that's available at the black widget um, that you can see here. Um, if you're not seeking CME and CE credit, please um, complete the evaluation for us um, to help inform our future webinars. Um, at this time, if you have a question, there's a few ways you can submit them. You can use the Q&A widget um, on, the, on the WebEx, um, and a lot of questions have been coming in along the way here. Um, or you can use our AT&T operator. Um, operator, at this time, can you remind our participants how to ask a question over the phone line? Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star then 1 on your touchtone phone. A voice prompt on your phone line will indicate when your line has been opened. You may remove yourself from the queue at any time by pressing the star key followed by the digit 2. Also, if you are using a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the corresponding digit. Once again, that's star 1 to ask a question. Great. Thank you. And while we're queuing up on the phone line, I wanted to ask one quick question um, that's come in during the call. Um, this is for Irene Moore. Um, Irene, you emphasize the importance of care managers and understanding how to communicate with patients and their families. What type of training would you recommend for care managers to help them support these patients and family members? Um, the Alzheimer's Association, um, if you're able to attend a family caregiving support group and listen to what family members say, um, I think we'd give you the best first-hand experience along with there's um, lots of written information about going forward with this. But great question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, operator, are there any callers on the line? We do have a couple in the queue, and just as a reminder, that's star one to ask a question over the phone. We'll take our first question. Yeah, hi. I would like to know how I can get the the pre because I look a little like eight minute late because my computer didn't want me to go in, and the po post test pre and post because I've been clicking uh, that red. red one and doesn't bring me anywhere. Oh, can you tell us your name and we'll follow up after the call? I'm sorry? Can you tell us your name and we can yeah. follow up after this call? Yeah, my name is uh, Rosalina Lynam. Okay. 
Um, my telephone number is... Oh, we have it. We have it. Thank you. Uh-huh. Okay, good. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. We'll go to our next question. Hi. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, is it possible for us uh, to download the slides or the presentation? And then if not, um, is it possible for you to go back to the slide that had on the mental status exams? I got some of them, but not all of them. Uh, yes, the slides will be posted on the resources for integrated care dot website. Okay. .com website um, after the call. Okay. Thank you. I'll take our next question. Hello. Um, thank you for a wonderful webinar. I really appreciate the effort and comprehensiveness. I'm curious, um, the, the examination of the patient, while um, every element you covered, both on the medical and um, um, both medical and nursing and social work, all three, um, seems beyond the scope of what most primary care docs feel they can do at this moment in history. Any thoughts about that? I understand that Dr. Callahan has done a great deal of work on care management, but I'm wondering about the pragmatics in, in the, the world we're living in today. This is Elizabeth Gallick. I can touch on it, and other folks can chime in. Um, in a busy primary care practice, you bring up a good point. It can be quite challenging to try to squeeze a lot of this information, you know, a lot of this assessment in in a short visit. So, some things that I would recommend is it's fine to kind of uh, parse things out over time. You don't necessarily have to cover everything in one visit. You can always bring the patient and the family member back in for another time. The other thing is in your practice, if you, a, a lot of practices have um, history forms that they'll either send ahead of time that can be filled out electronically or there are paper forms that you need to then bring in. If you include some of these um, scales that the caregivers can answer or even questions for the, the patient, you can get some of that information ahead of time. So those are some strategies that you can use. Um, but often you do need to break this out over the course of several visits. Thank you. We'll take our next question. Um, <clears throat> this isn't a question, it is a comment that there is the um, formerly the National Association of Professional Geriatric Care Managers, which has now become the aging life care profession, uh, that we are certified geriatric care managers located all over the country, and just <clears throat> excuse me, wanted to uh, give that resource as well. Thank you. Take our next question. Hi, this is Dane Duvall from the National Certification Board for Alzheimer Care. And recently there was a study out, uh, and well, first of all, we know that uh, probably less than 50% of people with Alzheimer's disease are actually have a diagnosis. But there was a recent study that said that about 40% of physicians did not actually give the diagnosis. Could um, anyone comment on that and what um, you might think that, is it the ethical part of it that the family says don't give the diagnosis? Uh, it, it's a little bit hard to understand that study. Thank you. Um, I can comment on that. Uh, it's a very um, sort of a discouraging report, um, but I think that uh, has been going on for quite some time and that and as you already suggested there's multiple threads to it um one is that uh on the one hand there's a bit of a uh, feeling among um some physicians that nothing can be done about this disease so what's the point in making the diagnosis and i think we've come a long way to 
moving um, providers to a place where they see the value. A part of that comes from the hope that an earlier diagnosis would help in the course of the disease, but um, as you already heard from Dr. Gallick and Ms. Moore, that the, there's so much more that can be done for the patient and the caregiver that uh, goes beyond changing the course of the disease. And getting that message out to providers has been very important. There is a small group of people that, let's just say they're in collusion with the primary care doc not to make the diagnosis. Um, and there's some real fear out there about being labeled. Um, people don't want to be labeled because they're afraid that other people will treat them differently, including their family, or they're afraid that their um, driving privileges are going to be taken away. They're afraid that they won't be able to manage their own money or that their home will be taken away. And those um, fears um, get compounded, I think, because there are both true and mythical stories out there in the social networks about these things happening. The difficulty with revealing um, the diagnosis is that um, a lot of providers would be well below the training of um, uh, a, a typical person working in a, a dementia care clinic. And so they themselves, we're talking about the providers now, are fearful um, about giving the diagnosis. They're fearful on multiple levels, um, not the least of which is this isn't going to be a diagnosis that I give in three minutes, like, you know, you have an ear infection. Um, this is uh, probably a family conference that needs at least 30, if not 90 minutes to engage in. Um, and like Dr. Gallick was mentioning, what we're trying to get docs to do and other providers is it doesn't all have to happen today. And you can make it uh, part of your schedule that you can break it up. So I know that's kind of a rambling answer, but it's um, a multidimensional problem. Well, and I, and I think if everyone on the line realizes uh, the hope for Alzheimer's Act could very well change that because, you know, as a lot of times reimbursable doesn't allow you to reschedule that what you're calling the, the family conference because, I mean, I'm sure that in your practice you, you want to be paid to, to, to have, but, but for that meeting, there, you can do it for the first time, but currently, unlike other chronic conditions, you cannot bill for that time. So that's, that's a problem. And I think if people know about the HOPE Act that's going through both houses of Congress, uh, just to reach out to their Congress people and uh, make sure that, that they know that that should be supported. Well, it's a great point. I mean, even if someone wants to not be reimbursed for a service, they won't be around very long. But we're trying to teach providers how to be a little bit um, craftier with the reason for those um, follow-up visits. And there are other reasons besides counseling, and counseling can be embedded in those visits. But what you describe is uh, part of the um, part of the barriers in a typical primary care practice. It's a great point. Thank you very much. We'll take our next question. Hello. Hello? We can hear you. Oh, hi. I have a question um, about this continuing education credits. I um, just wanted to confirm that people in New York State are not eligible for those continuing education credits for, for social workers. That's correct. Okay, thank you. We'll take our next question. Holler, your line is open. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if I uh, I sent this message in, uh, typed it in as well, but just want to clarify the the thoughts about there's a difference in the kinds of decisions practitioners need to use around confidentiality when a dementia diagnosis has been um, determined. And I'm assuming that question is getting at, you know, a more engagement of the key informants. And so if someone could just expound on that in a way that would help all of us understand 
not going past or changing the confidentiality of the patient, but also including in that circle the care team. Is this the question that was online that talked about when the patient doesn't want you to talk to the family? Yes. Okay. So I, I can speak a little bit about that, and, and others can feel free to, to chime in. Uh, it's a challenge. I find it doesn't have to happen very often, but it does happen on occasion. And in those instances, I have found personally that if you're able to build trust with the patient over time so that you may not be bringing the family in or an informant in at first, that eventually um, if you talk with them enough about the rationale behind it, that they often will let you at least speak to another person. Um, and so, and kind of giving them reasons of why that would be important. And, uh, you know, t to get someone else's perspective when you go over that, um, the challenges that they may be having with their memory and their cognitive functioning could cloud how they view things. And often I'll use an example of depression, um, that someone with depression will have cognitive distortions and that it's often helpful in that condition to get somebody else to give some information or, or a, a different perspective, and that we may need to use the same um, uh, methods with a memory complaint as well or a cognitive complaint. Great. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. We'll take our next question. Yeah, I would like to know uh, what kind of medications they can give it to and what doctors are the ones who made this diagnosis? Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Callahan. I, um, I, one of the points um, that we try to make with um, patients and families is the important but the limited um, efficacy or um, effectiveness of medications that are available. So um, there are a couple of classes of medications that are specifically prescribed for the cognitive symptoms, and um, they uh, are not tolerated by as many as one out of four patients, and so if you imagine this in clinical practice, um, you've heard this multiple times from the other speakers that um, this is di a discussion with the patient and with their caregiver about the pros and cons of um, these medications. Um, so uh, Dinepazil uh, is an example of this for the um, cognitive um, complaints. There is some um, evidence, although again it's controversial that those medications that were developed for the um, memory disturbance and the other cognitive complaints might help with behavioral complaints, but we have strongly encouraged families um, that when they're dealing with behavioral disturbances that um, using non-drug approaches is probably more effective and safer and less expensive but it's time intensive and it requires a, a patient caregiver and an insightful caregiver. And that is part of what the dementia care team is doing is essentially over time training up that caregiver to being able to handle um, mem many of these behavioral disturbances without the need for medications, without the need for bringing the patient to the emergency room or um, uh, other harsher in interventions. Um, there are um, no drugs that are specifically developed and tested to treat any specific um, behavioral disturbance. And so a patient or a caregiver might present to you and the caregiver is very upset because the patient is pacing or the patient's emptying the sock drawer or um, maybe the patient is um, drumming their fingers. 
Um, these are not things that we have um, medications to fix. They're um, things that we can teach the caregiver to deal with. Um, so medications are quite a controversial issue right now in the context of dementia. We certainly do use them, um, but it's a discussion with the patient and the caregiver about their pros and cons. Great. Thank you, Dr. Callahan. And, thank you. And thank you again for all of our speakers today, um, and thanks for all the participants as well. Um, as a reminder, if you're seeking CME or CE credit, please complete the post-test by 2 p.m. and the post-webinar evaluation by 5 p.m. Eastern Time. And for all of our participants, please fill out the post-webinar evaluation. As a reminder, if you have any questions or comments, please email Rick, which is R-I-C at Lewin, L-E-W-I-N dot com. The slides for today's presentation, a recording, and a transcript will be available on the Resources for Integrated Care dot com website shortly. We're also developing a series of related materials and resources that may be of interest to this group, and we'll notify all the participants of this call when those materials are available. Have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you so much for your participation. That concludes our conference for today. Thank you for your participation and for using AT&T teleconference service. You may now disconnect.